GOP lawmakers, led by former President Donald Trump, have long argued that Facebook, Google, and Twitter systematically suppress conservative users and websites. Governor Greg Abbott and the Republican legislature, they say the law is needed to prevent social media companies from stifling conservative voices. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is signing a bill that allows residents to sue social media companies if their access is unfairly restricted or revoked. But regulating the internet isn't a responsibility of the states. It's the federal government's job a role that takes us back to the golden age of the internet, the late 1990s. When then-President Bill Clinton signed the Communications Act of 1996 into law, it contained language carving out protection for the nascent providers of message boards. It's called Section 230. So what does Section 230 say exactly? It says that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Essentially, Section 230 means that companies hosting other speech aren't saying it and aren't liable for it. Companies have the right to police material on their websites as they see fit. When they display photos, chats, or videos, they are in no way saying it represents their beliefs. These 26 words of Section 230 are what made the internet as we know it and social media companies possible today. The Information Superhighway. For the early service providers of the 90s and aughts, this was really great. They didn't have the resources to police the content on their sites. So-called interactive computer services didn't have to worry about thousands of potential lawsuits. Instead, they could focus on growing and making money. As much as Section 230 granted them the right to remove posts, it also gave them a pass. How does it work? Well, when a user signs up for a site like Facebook or Twitter, they sign a contract or terms of service. In it, a company lays out the ground rules of what's accepted behavior and reserves the right to kick a user out if they don't play nice. Which leads us to today. Time and time again, online trolls, violent extremists, terrorists, and school shooters have used corners of social media to stage, plan, or promote violence, or spread false, dangerous information about COVID-19 and its vaccines, as well as lies about voter fraud and election tampering. Following years of tragic events, most of the public expected social media companies to roll out tougher moderation policies to try to prevent the next crisis. After all, it's what politicians have demanded of the companies, and companies did respond with more moderation. Sites have always had to moderate to some degree. If they didn't, users would be overwhelmed with scams, pornography, or worse, making their platforms inhospitable to users. But the political climate in the United States has become more divisive and social media platforms' moderation of political voices has landed them in hot water and set up a battle in the Supreme Court. Florida's Attorney General has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on whether states are allowed to force tech companies such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to host content which violates their content policies. It's still unclear if the conservative-leaning bench will take on the petition from Florida, but there is already one Section 230 case on its 2022 docket, Gonzalez v. Google. The court will decide whether or not Google violated the law when its subsidiary YouTube at the time knowingly permitted and recommended terrorist videos that the plaintiff says led to the 2015 ISIS attack in Paris. Google argues Section 230 protects it from those claims. Whatever the decision, the debate over content moderation will go on. Lawmakers in states all over the country have introduced more than 100 bills aimed at regulating social media, guaranteeing that a fight for control will continue.